Good afternoon, everybody. My name's Wendy Fenton, and I'm the Humanitarian Practice Network Coordinator with the Humanitarian Policy Group at ODI. And I'd like to welcome all of you in the room, as well as the 425 people that are watching online. That's a record, actually, for one of our events. So we're really pleased at the high levels of interest in, in this event. Um, so I'd like to welcome you to this uh, public event here, which is launching two new publications by the Humanitarian Practice Network. Uh, the first is the network paper, Preventing and Responding to Gender-Based Violence in Humanitarian Crises, by Rebecca Holmes and Darini Bhuvanendra. And Rebecca is sitting right over here. And the other is Humanitarian Exchange 60, which contains, it's a, the special feature is gender-based violence and emergencies. So all of the articles in the issue are on um, aspects of gender-based violence. Now, the, the network paper reflects on the findings of a diffid funded review of the literature on this topic. And this, the, the literature re review was also written by Rebecca and Darini, with support from Beth Van, who is a gender-based violence expert based in Washington, DC. And um, before I go any further, I just want to remind you to please put your mobile phones on silent if you would. But you're very welcome to tweet. We hope that you will. And the, the hashtag is uh, GBV, hashtag GBV. And I'd be really grateful if you could hold your questions and comments until we open the floor to the audience for questions, comments, and discussion. And that will be the second hour of the, uh, of the two hour event. Um, I mean, as, as we know, and as you've seen in the invitation, you know, international concern over gender-based violence and emergencies has grown significantly in recent years. And a number of good practice standards, guidelines, training resources, and other goods have been produced and developed. But despite this substantial increase in interest and attention and guidance materials, very little of the evidence and learning from good practice has been adequately documented or disseminated. And in addition, there are differing views on the concepts and terminology, how you apply these, what programming priorities we should have. And there's a general sort of lack of agreement around many of these um, within those who, who work in the community. And, and this affects how we define and prioritize, prevent and respond, I think, to gender-based violence in humanitarian contexts. And today's uh, context and conflicts continue to be marked by gender-based violence. And so humanitarian agencies are understandably seeking to understand how they can better prevent and respond to GBV and emergencies. And so today, I'm going to be asking our distinguished panel, who I'll introduce in a minute, to draw on their knowledge and experience to discuss some of the key challenges associated with prevention and response programming, the different forms of violence facing women and girls in particular, but not just women and girls, and the ways in which the needs of survivors can be better addressed in humanitarian crises. And so now I'd like to, to introduce our panelists, and I must apologize for the lack of gender balance on the panel, um, and in the uh, humanitarian exchange for that matter. And we had, invited, uh, we had invited someone to write about men and boys, a man in fact, but he wasn't able to do that in the end. And we're going to be holding a round table in fact, together with Plan International on uh, gender-based violence in men and boys later in, in May. So we are looking at this issue as well. Um, first of all, I'd like to introduce Clea Khan, who's on my right, and she's a humanitarian advisor with the Conflict Humanitarian and Security Department in the UK's Department for International Development. And prior to working with DFID, Clea has a long, long range of experience, which I won't attempt to summarize. She worked with Médecins Sans Frontières and a variety of other NGOs in a range of countries, including Sri Lanka, Sudan, Chad, and Niger, amongst many others. On my immediate left is Aurelie Lamazier, who is the Gender Issues Coordinator at Geneva Call, based in Geneva, or she will be until the end of this month. <laughs> She's joining Save the Children after that. But Aurelie wrote an article for the exchange on Geneva Call's efforts in engaging with armed non-state actors on issues of gender-based violence. But before joining Geneva Call, she also worked for a number of organizations, including Save the Children and MSF again, with field missions to Pakistan, Afghanistan, OPT, Chad, Sudan, and the DRC. And then finally, on my far left is Sarah Cotton, who is a public affairs advisor with the ICRC in the UK. And Sarah contributed an article to the exchange on ICRC's work on gender-based violence. 
She leads the work of the IRC, ICRC with Parliament and communications around IRC policy, operations and concerns. And she also works to develop and disseminate ICRC policy on sexual violence and violence against healthcare workers. And then last but not least, joining us by video conference from New York and Washington are um, Aisha Bain, who is on the far right of the screen. Sorry, Aisha, I need to look at you this way, but you're behind me. <laughs> and Aisha is also the author of an article in The Exchange on service-based data and is the advocacy program advisor for the Women's Protection Empowerment Unit at IRC, the International Rescue Committee. Aisha led emergency responses for the IRC in DRC in 2008, 2009, and 2013, and was a deputy director in Haiti. And she's also responded to crises in the Philippines and Ethiopia. And um, on the other side of the screen is Alina Potts. And Alina authored an article on operationalizing GBV guidance. She's the Emergency Response and Preparedness Coordinator of the IRC's Women Protection Empowerment Technical Team. And she led GBV programming as part of IRC's Emergency Response Team in Syria, the DRC, and Lebanon. And she's been involved in many other humanitarian responses in Africa, Asia, and the Middle East. So before before we actually begin, and we're going to handle this session, I'm going to ask a series of questions to our panelists that I, I hope that they'll respond to, and then I'll let you ask them questions after I'm finished. But first, I'd just like to say a few words about the literature review. I wanted to highlight a couple of the key findings, because I think it helps to set the, the scene for the rest of the discussion. Um, and just to point out that this uh, network paper, which is based on the literature review, the review itself looked at about 100 uh, documents. But out of those 100 documents which were screened, only 15 were actually included in the literature review. And that's because they, they were the only ones that actually focused on outcomes as opposed to inputs and outputs or processes. And so we're really wanting to look at what the effects of you know, the GBV programming have been on uh, the people that they're supposed to, to have an impact on. Um, and so, but I think that also very starkly highlights the need for, for more evidence or for documenting, you know, good quality evidence that we can actually use in the work that we're doing. I don't have time to give a detailed presentation on the, on the review, and you can certainly talk to Rebecca uh, during the break uh, after, the, uh, after the event at our networking session, and I hope you'll read the paper. But some of the key findings were that there, despite this small and rather context-specific body of evidence, these 15 studies, there still is evidence that of good practice, emerging good practice. And I think some of the key things was that were that um, community-level awareness-raising activities, for example, which use things like cinema, radio, behavior change, education, seem to be particularly effective at increasing the recognition of different types of violence, reducing levels of victim blame, decreasing acceptance of violence, and increasing the knowledge of rights and legal issues. And one study suggested that the more exposure to these messages, the stronger was the effect. At the household individual level, targeted and tailored awareness raising and discussion groups, which included or targeted men via men's groups, have also been found to reduce the acceptance of violence, improve empathy for survivors, and increase knowledge of gender relations and women's rights. And then the studies also demonstrate that improved access to services for victims of violence can be achieved not only by increasing the provision of services, but by ensuring that services are delivered appropriately and are sensitive to survivors' needs and, and context. And so what are the implications of, of these findings for policy and practice, you know, we ask ourselves. And some of those that uh, were identified by the, the researchers were that there's definitely a pressing need, as I said before, to promote the collection and analysis of data on GBV and to share and disseminate this to inform GV, GBV programming. And we'll talk a little bit more in, during our session, I'm sure our panelists will, about what some of the issues are around that, constraints to doing that better. Um, monitoring evaluation mechanisms need to be strengthened across GBV programming. And this is another, uh, another point that maybe isn't surprising to us. I think in the humanitarian sector generally, we struggle with monitoring and evaluation, but it seems to be a particular issue with this programming. 
And ensuring that programs are appropriate to survivors' needs in the culture and social context is, is critical. Because uh, a number of studies flagged up the need for more flexible and adaptable uh, programs, especially in complex emergencies. Girl-friendly services to address the specific types of violence that girls might face, such as female genital mutilation, amongst others. And the importance of involving men in programs, as we've already said. And the need to recognize the, the programming implications of working with men and boys in the prevention and response to violence, as well as identifying the needs of men and boys as survivors of violence. Um, so the studies highlighted the need to invest in continuous, specialized, and culturally appropriate training of staff, men and women, as well as the other relevant service providers like police and health, uh, health staff. And um, on the research agenda, more evidence is needed on emergency settings because we don't have, have a lot of that. There's been quite a lot of work on the development side, but not so much in some of the humanitarian contexts. So we need to know more about the incidence of violence as well as the access, quality, and outcomes of services for GBV response interventions. We need to, more understanding of the type of gender-based violence addressed at various uh, uh, specific stages of emergencies and whether interventions are appropriate to the needs of survivors of particular types of GBV at particular times or stages. And finally, we need to have more uh, evidence on the impacts of GBV interventions in post-disaster settings and from across countries and regions. These 15 studies are fairly limited in terms of their geographic scope and we need to expand that. So thank you for that. And, um, I'm sorry to take some of your time in going over that, but I just thought it would be important to pull out a few of the key, the key findings to set the discussion. So now I'm going to um, turn to our panelists, and I'm going to start off with, uh, with Clea and Aisha, if I, if I may. Um, and I, I've noted that Network Paper 77 says that the focus of most programming, funding, and guidance is on preventing and responding to sexual violence, which is often assumed to be raped by strangers who are combatants in many contexts, in conflict contexts. Um, but the available evidence suggests that intimate partner violence, IPV, I think as it's called, may be the most prevalent form of gender-based violence, even in situations of conflict. And other forms of GBV, such as trans transactional sex, abduction, female genital mutilation, and the risk, other risks faced by young girls in terms of early enforced marriage, are addressed either indirectly or appear to be treated as lesser priorities. And I, I just wondered, because I know both of you have been to the Philippines recently, um, whether maybe starting with Clea, you could talk about what types of gender-based violence are occurring there. And, and what approaches and programming are, are being used in this context? Sure, thank you. 